Welcome everyone. Good morning, uh, afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is James Rosenshine. I'm back again with corrosion under installation over coffee, CUI over coffee for short. And uh, it's great to be back at the end of a interesting 2021 for everyone. So let's just remind ourselves about CUI over coffee. Uh, it is aimed for promoting online discussions within the asset integrity community to exchange information, experiences and ideas. Um, we have the pleasure of having a distinguished panel today with Matt Healy. Hello, Matt. Hi, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for those of you who are elsewhere. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent, Matt. And hello, uh, Prafal Sharma. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. So I will give you a chance to introduce yourselves. Shortly. So we had eight, eight online sessions last year in season one. I don't know if you can recall 2020, it's some time ago now, but we had some really good healthy debates on the topic of CUI and corrosion in general. And uh, this year we hosted another three sessions with a bit of a twist because we wanted to not just talk about corrosion management, but actually what our company is doing about it within the ecosystem. Uh, and it's fair to say CUI is still a bloody pain and costly for us all. So we're still here talking about it. We, today, we've got a, a really great twist. Uh, we'll be tackling the topic of corrosion management for carbon capture, utilization and storage and new energies. So it's a big topic. There's lots of uh, investment going into CCS or CCUS. And um, recently, I think last week, UK government announced 64 million in competition funding for new innovation in CCUS. So you can understand it's something which everyone is now focused on as we move towards reaching our net zero targets and reducing carbon emissions across the globe. So um, I'm pleased to welcome our guest today. And, um, and more importantly, really, um, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to have someone who's been in the CCUS world um, for years, and um, he's an expert in the field. So please, Matt, can you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. So I'm, I'm Matt Healy. I'm the founder of um, Pace CCS, uh, whose offices I'm sitting in right now. Um, I, I've been working in CCS for about as long as it's been a thing, really. Um, so initially, about 10 years ago, getting involved in some of the very early sort of fluid definitions and understanding um, what sorts of um, fluids we're dealing with um, with CCS. Um, I was involved uh, with the White Rose project with sort of the first uh, first wave of UK CCS projects. Um, that, that project was cancelled when its funding was pulled, uh, as it was um, with the other project at the time um, that, that Shell were running at Peterhead. Um, and really pleased now to be running pace and be right at the forefront of um, CCS, the, this growing industry in the UK and worldwide. Fantastic, Matt. And I'm, I'm curious as to where actually are you sitting in London? Which bridge is that behind you? It's a, Tower, Tower Bridge. Yeah, it's Tower, Tower Bridge. So we've, got, we've, got, we've got an office with a nice view. Um, it's not outdoors weather out there, but there's a nice balcony and who knows, maybe some point when uh, there's a bit less COVID kicking around um, and the weather's a bit nicer, maybe next summer we can uh, you know, have a few people around to actually enjoy it rather than me sitting in an empty office where everyone's working from home. I'm sure everyone would appreciate that. Um, but having said that, it's nice to do an online chat as we are approaching the, the holiday season. Um, is, I think everyone's is. trying to um, relax and not actually have to have to travel at the moment, are they? So, um, and you mentioned um, one of the projects being um, pulled. And uh, for my um, research I've done in the CCUS industry, it seems to be a lot of projects that are getting cancelled, abandoned, pulled. So why there, there, is was that? Of, there, there was a bit of that before. Um, everyone's known that CCS is something which is going to come along at some point. And, and, you know, it's been on the radar for a long time, um, but it's only really in the past two years where there's been the combination of, you know, a, a decent carbon price, particularly in the EU. The EU carbon price is higher and it's been solid for a long time, and that helps investment. Um, but there's also political will. You know, in the, here in the UK, we've got what is apparently genuine political commitment for CCS um, from all sides of politics. 
uh, and, and there's a similar situation in the EU as well. Um, but we're also seeing projects um, in Southeast Asia, which are being driven by um, very well understood coming demand for blue hydrogen, uh, particularly in Japan and Korea. Uh, and we're seeing projects in North America as well, where the, um, the tax credit system for um, carbon storage is, is a solid enough foundation for projects to go ahead. Um, okay. So as ever, it, it comes down to money. <clears throat> um, yes. The project White Rose got cancelled because it was government entirely government funded. And when the government decided they had better money to, you know, better things to spend the money on, then that was that. But happily, the money is coming from a lot of different sources now. Every oil and gas company is busily rebranding itself as an energy company because yes. they know hydrogen's the future. Um, and there's, yeah, uh, hydrogen, there's only two ways of getting it. And one is green from renewables and one is zero carbon from hydrocarbons. And, and that requires CCS. So it's a, a very exciting time. Yeah, it sounds exciting. And um, and talking about money, uh, Prafal Sharma, you you seem to be looking quite sharp these days. You've got some new glasses by the looks of it. Can you introduce yourself, please? Well, thank you, um, James. Uh, yeah, interesting that you introduced me to the money part <laughs> with the money side, <laughs> which is not the right. So um, my name is Prafal. Um, I'm currently the co-founder and chief technology officer of Corrosion Radar. And I'm on a mission personally to bring innovations and technologies for the asset integrity community. And, and that's my personal drive and observing and looking at what are the new energies happening, uh, new energy technologies and how we can contribute to that. Mm. And, I, and, and I noticed uh, Prafal, uh, so Corrosion Radar, great relationship with the oil and gas technology center up in Aberdeen, but that, as we all know, has now changed name to the Net Zero Technology Center. So your relationship with now the Net, uh, Net Zero Technology Center, a bit of a mouthful, has that changed? Um, is Corrosion Radar still playing a part as part of their agenda? I think there are two parts of this. One is we have to keep running what we, have, we are running in the sense of energies, and that's continuing to be the trend that the existing infrastructure needs to run for the next few decades, and we can't take our eyes off on that. However, uh, again, from the Net Zero Technology Center, which is a consortium of industries, as you said, and government and industries in Aberdeen, catering to UK North Sea, um, uh, the discussion have shifted. The name change itself reflects that it is a Net Zero Center. So the, the focus of the technologies are going to be not only keep running existing assets, but also how do we uh, decarbonize the assets. Understood. Okay, so um, yeah, it's it's certainly there's um, significant movement, and as Matt said, over the last two years, certainly I've seen that. So um, it's great to to have you on board. It's great to see that our CUI over coffee community is um, still um, expanding. We've we've seen new guests each 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 session that we run. Um, so thank you very much. So let's get let's get on with the the subject corrosion in carbon capture storage and new energies. And it's a, it's a new world we're transitioning into. Um, and as Praffel said, asset integrity will still be um, a, um, an important topic for these operators. So you've got the conventional oil and gas industry. You know, they are obviously playing a part in moving towards net zero um, due to their expertise in these large capital projects and, on, and, and operations. Um, so are we, are we slowly moving to this world? Are we jumping into this world? Is that completely a fresh start? Certainly when it comes to corrosion management, are we having to do things completely different or is it the same old issue? Now, these are the things that is playing on my mind and um, it'd be great to, to have this discussion today. Some general housekeeping very quickly. We will probably be um, around 30 minutes in terms of chat and then we'll open up to questions and answers as usual. Um, Feel free to post all questions and answers um, through um, the usual window. Uh, we will be recording this session and posting it on YouTube as usual. Uh, we can pass the mic to people who are um, not shy and want to have their voice heard. So feel free to do that, please. So let's get started. I hope everyone's got their coffee, hot drink, uh, kawa in the Middle East. Excellent, that was nice. So let's get started. So let's start opening it up with the, the first uh, question. And um, I probably will 
probably just provide some context to the discussion that we're having around corrosion management. Quickly, Pratt, I mean, we've, I think the last session we had was around the summertime. So what, what's been happening of late in the corrosion management world? Well, there are uh, many things in the news. The first one was COVID-19. And, you know, in, in, in addition to that, we also heard about energy transition. So Glasgow organized COP26. And th there was a single sentence which came out of it as a template. Like, I will be net zero. You know, this may be governments or companies. I'll be net zero by 20xx. Now, it may be 2050, 2060. Uh, and then people started asking, what are you going to do for 2030s? And some companies, super majors, oil companies, energy companies have committed to 2030 targets. And that's not going to happen overnight. So um, it's happening now. And that's the main trend which we are seeing. The single word coming out of that probably is energy transition and decarbonization of existing industries. Um, now, as an innovator, as an asset integrity technologist, um, there's nothing new here in the sense there's probably more opportunities to contribute to this trend because asset integrity is like healthcare for the industries and healthcare in wherever shape or form, it's always gonna be there. But it's a massive opportunity. We have the uh, ability to bring technologies for the new infrastructure, which is going to build up. So that's a major trend which we are seeing and probably today's discussion is about carbon capture and I'm keen to learn from Matt what that entails but there's a massive opportunity there mm. as well yeah and no, it's interesting and um and, and thank you for that and, and 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 i've had the pleasure of being in the middle east over the last couple of months and you'd think okay in the middle east it's dry um there's no uh corrosion and insulation uh issues because there's lack of moisture water well from my understanding um there's a lot of equipment such as dehydration units dryers that um have to get involved with thermal cycling and, 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 and cooling. Um, and that's where there is issues with moisture and water. So um, it, it's interesting that um, you mentioned about, um, you know, moving to the net zero uh, technologies. You know, is that something, an issue where we're seeing thermal cycling involved with that? So that maybe we, we need to you know, touch on some of these technical issues. Uh, Matt, um, What's your background? Have you actually been exposed to corrosion before? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have. But first, James, it's impressive that you've been in the Middle East for that long and somehow come out without any tan whatsoever. Ah, it's, cheers, it's thank real, you. <laughs> that's really quite something. So well done. Um, yeah, I, I have been. Um, so my background is, is you know, goes back to the foundational stuff. It's the thermodynamics, it's the fluid definition. You know, that's the sort of thing that I live and breathe. Um, and that's fundamentally the reason why he, we're here at pace with dealing with co2 because whilst you know co2 has been around the fluids that we're dealing with with ccs are, are new and they require that understanding and anyone who's involved in asset integrity and corrosion will know that you absolutely have to understand your fluid before you can even take the first step um and so i've been far more involved with corrosion than i ever have done over the past few years um all related to ccs um there's obviously been some uh, I mean, in, in the Gorgon project, a high profile failure of a CCS project because of corrosion issues. Um, and it's absolutely fundamental. You know, it is a fundamental safety issue. It's a fundamental integrity issue and it's not optional. Um, it's something which needs to be solved for every single CCS project. Uh, it can be solved. It takes good engineering. Um, but yeah, I've been getting I've been getting more and more into it um, with that, I guess, that basis you know with the, the the foundation of understanding fluids and understanding these developments from a um a bit of a, a broader view and it's interesting you mentioned gorgon project it'd be great if we could pick on that as um as a use case um which i think you said um something that you've got some experience in we may not many people know about this uh issue that they've had so let's probably pick on that and uh the reason why I'm interested is because I saw the Gorgon project being in the news only last week. I think um, they had a problem with their LNG uh, train one. Last month had a gas leak um, and uh, therefore led to an unscheduled shutdown and repairs. And now they've got another one with um, the, the train three. So there seems to be some issues there um, and um, it'd be great to pick your, your brain and experience on that. So. Before we probably do that, Matt, I mean, again, for my benefit, I'm sure for the audience, 
could you just give us a, a very quick feel about what is carbon capture utilization and storage what we're talking about yeah absolutely um so it's the the simple fact that instead of putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere when we burn something we want to capture that carbon, we want to pump it up uh, so it's at high pressure, and then we want to store it below the surface. And that means in a depleted hydrocarbon reservoir or in a deep saline aquifer. So essentially, we uh, can continue on with industry, we can continue on with power and electricity and heating and transport and all of those things that we need, um, but we don't put the, the CO2 into the atmosphere. It's a big part of net zero. Uh, increasing green energy is also a part, and the two very much go hand in hand um, and are complementary technologies. Um, we are transitioning as a world away from hydrocarbons as a fuel and towards truly green energy, um, but that transition is going to take time. Um, and CCS and what we call blue energy, which is where we're still producing carbon dioxide, but then capturing it and storing it in the ground, is um, a, an important stepping stone because it allows us to get to net zero faster and cheaper and it allows um, existing industry to exist. So, for example, if you've got a, um, a power plant, um, and you're producing power, that power plant might be 10 years into its 50 year life. Uh, if you can retrofit that power plant to capture the CO2 and tie it into a CCS network, then all of a sudden you have a zero carbon power plant. And in fact, if your power plant is um, being powered by wood chips, so biofuels, trees, it's a net negative carbon power plant now because the trees are pulling CO2 from the air, turning into tree. You're turning that tree into power and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide goes into the ground the net outcome is you're producing power and you're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequestering it for tens of thousands of years in a depleted reservoir. So it's Sounds a, rather complex, Matt. <laughs> I guess so. I don't think so. You know, like it's uh, it's what I do. So, you know, of course yeah. I have to say that. Um, but it, yeah, yeah. I, I presume there's lots of different um, new techniques um, and uh, infrastructure involved, but then you mentioned about repurposing existing assets. So, if that's the case, these existing assets that are used typically in oil and gas, um, we, you know, we were already talking in oil and gas about life extension and how we can squeeze more life out of these um, old assets. So now we're talking about potentially using them even further. Yes, and, and not just the assets that are out there, you know, the, the power plants and the refineries, but also we're looking at reusing uh, pipelines, reusing wells and reusing um, offshore structures, so um, platforms mm. and so forth. So this is interesting. We had a good question just coming from William Bazakali, um, and he mentioned, and he would like to ask you, Matt, um, he believes there are currently 60 CCS facilities globally, um, uh, but I heard that this could expand to 2,000 plants by 2050. So there seems to be not only a lot of repurposing existing assets, but lots of new builds going in. So is this, is this realistic? Is this, are we talking about this significant growth in CCS? Yeah, that, that's in line with, with our estimates that we've done here. We think there's closer to 100 now um, in design. Um, the first true CCS project, which is where we're decarbonizing existing industry and taking carbon dioxide from various different sources. Um, the first major one of those will start up in a couple of years. There are existing CCS projects, but they're a bit like um, like Gorgon. Um, they're decarbonizing a hydrocarbon gas stream. So they've got, they're producing gas, turning it into LNG, but that gas just comes along with lots of CO2 naturally. And all they're doing is capturing that CO2 and disposing of it locally. So that's a, if you like, that's a simple version of a CCS project. Most CCS projects that are in operation now are quite simple. And these larger and more complex ones uh, will be starting up over the next two or three years. And that um, number of 2,000, it's, um, it's a very simple one to arrive at. Um, you look at the amount of carbon that we're producing right now, you look at the amount that can be replaced with green energy, and you look at the amount that requires blue energy, um, and you see the amount of carbon dioxide, you look at the size of what a CCS project is. It's about, you know, each project is about 10 million tonnes per annum. So we've got about 20, you know, 20 to 30 million tonnes per year of CO2 that needs to be disposed of. So yeah, yeah, 2000 yeah. Um, uh, projects is, is spot on. Okay, well, um, that's, that's really uh, good to know. Um, as we move into this um, industry, we need to obviously, I think all of us in the corrosion management world um, understand it better because um, it's certainly a, a significant 
opportunity for people's careers and also being able to make a difference. And uh, and Pruffle, um, a man who's been involved in corrosion management in conventional oil and gas, and you recently been uh, talking at lots of events, um, both on the panel and um, as, a, as a host. So um, are people now asking you about CCS and what, what can be done about it? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I think uh, there's obviously a lot of talks about it. Yes, I mean, the, the, there are designs on the table which are going in, material selections. Uh, I would say necessarily, not necessarily the uh, corrosion management is any different. Uh, it's more of a better design. Um, how do we avoid, it's, it's basically gas processing in, in the sense, once you capture it using amine uh, absorbers and regenerators, that's been going for ages in uh, oil and gas industry. You know, uh, every, every uh, gas processing plant or every gas um, producing plant have this kind of carbon capture, carbon dioxide capture. So they are experienced in doing corrosion management for carbon dioxide. It's, it's more of when the new assets are coming in, um, A, what can we do different in corrosion management? So obviously monitoring comes in. And when we say monitoring, it can be either uh, internal monitoring of the pipelines or assets or external monitoring like for CUI or soil side corrosion. But I think when the, 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 the question is not about uh, how do we manage it? Um, the question is about how can we manage it better? Like whatever in the past manual methods have been there, how can we bring more automation into it? Because suddenly um, it's an accelerated pace of industrial developments in CCS. So uh, bringing mm. more automation to the, to the, to the, to the, to the uh, table. That's the, you mentioned about material selection and, and, uh, and, you know, from, from, from my experience in new builds in oil and gas, there's a lot of thought that goes into the design of these assets. So um, it, you know, by design, we'll hopefully through um, also the material selection and the, 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 the barriers such as water barriers, we'll have a collective um, uh, solution to being able to combat corrosion. Um, and, and there's been a lot of great work that's gone into these um, new techniques and, and uh, designs and solutions. So, um, and you hear that a lot, but then we hear a lot about um, CUI still being an issue. So why is that, Praffle? Why, you know, in the traditional oil and gas, are we still having problems with CUI when, when we've got all these great coatings and, 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 you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into the material that's been selected? Well, I mean, the, the, the key word is water. So water is a lifesaver for humans, right? You know, we, we like water, we, yeah, I'm, I'm drinking part of the water right now, but if it goes in the wrong places, it becomes a devil. And carbon capture is one such place um, inside and outside the pipe. So inside the pipe, if, if, it, uh, if for, by any mistake of the dehydrators are malfunctioning or are not there, the water gets in in the carbon dioxide stream and becomes acid, it's an acid gas and acids, eats metals. Uh, similarly, water goes out outside, you know, this is an ind industrial plant, carbon capture is no very different from any other industrial plant. Uh, outside, there are temperature ranges where insulations are being used. And same, uh, you know, uh, in the CUI range, if water goes in, it starts to corrode. So the key part is our water. How do we keep the water out? Hmm. And um, that's, that's the main driver here. Um, okay. Matt can answer much more than that, but that's what I understand. That's interesting, actually, because uh, you, know, you could be naive and say, well, why is corrosion an issue in CCS? You know, COT in, in dry conditions is fine, um, but then when you mix COT with water, it becomes a corrosive acid. So simply just why not just keep water out? But we've seen in traditional oil and gas that um, you know, these facilities are struggling still to be able to uh, manage where, uh, where there might be a water ingress that gets in, under the installation. So it, it sounds very simple, but it seems to be a, a still a big problem. Um, so Matt, is this a problem? Um, you you, you, you're, James, you're completely right that it is very simple and Pruffle is spot on is that it is about keeping water out and carbon dioxide is from a corrosion perspective very benign, it's very stable, it doesn't interact with metals. Um, but 
the consequences of getting water in are absolutely catastrophic for all the reasons that Pruffell lays out, because it is acid gas, it creates acid and it eats metal. And that's exactly what went on at Gorgon. Uh, so Gorgon uh, is a CCS project due to start up um, tied into an LNG plant. We, you were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Um, when they started up the, um, the CCS part of the facility, um, they had noted that they'd suffered absolutely catastrophic corrosion, despite the fact that it was only a few weeks after um, you know, the, the commissioning process. So right at the beginning of day one. And what they, the reason why they suffered catastrophic corrosion, which cost them two years before they were able to start it up, um, was wow. because they ended up with, with water and CO2 in their system at the same time. Um, it's not a fault of the design. There was, a, there was a management decision taken to remove dehydration, if you can believe that, um, as a value engineering, thinking they'd save themselves some money. And um, uh, James, you might want to look away if you thought my previous explanation was a little bit uh, technical, but I'm going to brave a more technical description for those that are interested. Yeah, yeah. please. Now, so I've, got a, I've got a CO2 molecule here. Here we go. The lights in here, um, there's no one in here because everyone's working from home. I'm a bit darker than I was. They've all gone off, so I'm not moving. But <laughs> hopefully you can see this. So this is CO2. It's a, it's a linear molecule. We've got carbon in the middle and oxygen, oxygen. So CO2. This is what it is. Um, in a CCS system, at low pressure, CO2 is a gas. At high pressure, it's a liquid. Um, and when it's a liquid, um, you get the molecules a bit closer together. Now, on the Gorgon project, they wanted to operate with CO2 as a liquid, which is very normal for a CCS project. But what happens is, as a gas, um, CO2 is a non-polar gaseous molecule that doesn't interact with water at all. So water is not soluble in CO2 gas. It doesn't dissolve into the gas. You don't get much in the way of humidity. But when it's a liquid, when you get the molecules closer together, um, they interact with one another. And so you get a small amount of polarity change across this fairly long molecule. So you get a slightly negative end and a slightly positive end as the electrons in the molecule slightly redistribute. And what that does is it means that it's now ever so slightly polar. And that means that in CO2 liquid, water is actually pretty soluble. It's much, much more soluble in liquid than it is in gas. And so on the Gorgon project, they looked at the solubility of their, um, their water in the liquid CO2, which is where they're operating. And they went, we'll never see water. It'll be dry. It all dissolves into the liquid. We've got a nice big margin. We don't need, need dehydration because all of this water is going to be absorbed into the liquid CO2. And the one thing they failed to consider is that before startup, before they'd started up their compressors, for a few weeks, they had a system which was in the gas phase. And so they filled up their system with that CO2. The water was less soluble. They had condensation. All of a sudden, you've got um, free water and CO2 in a system which is designed for no corrosion. And they had catastrophic corrosion in a matter of weeks. And so it seems simple, but if you get it wrong, the consequences are huge. So we're talking about aggressive corrosion here as well, Matt, not just you know, a slow burn that we see typically in other... Yeah, we're industry. talking enough, with, uh, enough within weeks that they decided that they had to replace um, essentially all of their pipelines and wells. Wow. How long was the, uh, the downtime associated with that? Two years. Two years? Two years. So from a loss of production point of view, that was significant, I presume? Uh, no, the CO2 just went up the vent and into the atmosphere. Um, they have to they have to buy back that CO2, so it will cost them a lot of money, but it didn't affect the operation of the LNG plant. So um, uh, Chevron, the company responsible, um, I think it's it would be reasonable to guess that they were more interested in making sure their money making asset, the much more complex LNG facility, would stay online. Uh, they looked to save a bit of money by removing the dehydration from their CCS system, um, but in the end, it doesn't actually affect the operations of the um, the LNG plant. So the LNG ran for two years. Uh, two years later, they started up the CCS plant and they've had um, further problems with their CCS plant since. So it's an old problem, cutting corners that we see a lot of over the years um, in the design and, and, and going into operations in order to try and make more money. And um, sounds like you know we, we've been caught in, in, in this project. Um, and yeah, I mean, you, you must see it all the time with, uh, with CUI, James, you know, where mm. someone has taken sort of a, a cheaper option when it comes to protecting a pipeline. And in this case, they could see an easy cost saving. Um, they thought it wouldn't cost them and just didn't do the engineering that was required. I want to add that this removal of the dehydration was done. Every engineer that I've spoken to on the project has said that they and 
the engineering team objected to the change, but it was too much of a, a saving as a value engineering um, session that um, yeah, it, the, the decision was taken regardless. Understood. So um, this is a great example, um, and you spoke about the the impact, and it does it does make me wonder um, when it comes to carbon capture storage, if any of this gets out. That surely that from a reputation point of view is an issue and also obviously from an environment point of view it's an issue so is it really that full uh, you know um, future proof when it comes to um, being able to stop carbon getting into the environment yeah the, the technology is quite straightforward um I, I, it's a it's a real pity and i think that it's a failure of responsibility that chevron have never published the technical details around what went wrong at gorgon um, I've pieced this together from what I know about CCS, what's in the public domain, and from speaking to engineers um, who have worked on the project. Um, no, from a technology point of view, CCS is very straightforward. In fact, it's been going on for, for decades in the form of enhanced oil recovery. People have been using carbon dioxide to improve production from oil wells for a very long time. Um, so, I mean, every project needs to be diligently designed and it needs good engineering and it needs proper risk assessments but from a technological point of view it's um it's very straightforward it's just it's just new okay and 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 so maybe this is something we need to as you say if we can promote this more um learn from this um then these lessons learned could be um used um for all this new investment going into ccs and uh you know, I, I certainly feel from been working in oil and gas for many years, we talk about lessons learned, but we still have lots of issues and lots of issues associated with corrosion and corrosion in insulation. So what do you see, Prafel, being lessons learned from hearing what Matt has to say and being in at the forefront of doing things differently to, to address CUI and corrosion management? You know, what do you see being the lessons learned? Yeah, I think uh, Gorgon pod project uh, creates an eye-opening uh, situation where things go wrong. Um, uh, it, do, it, it is not always go, they go, don't go by the books. So in this case, if the value engineering decided that we have to remove the dehydrator because it's never going to have a water, what are the mitigations and insurance against it? Uh, I believe I will push for the case of an automation, even monitoring against monitoring all the say wall loss uh, or, or uh, all the corrosion monitoring uh, systems to monitor for those exceptions that hey in in usual situations we will not have corrosion inside we will not have corrosion outside but in exceptional circumstances we need to have an insurance using automation sensors to monitor whether we are deviating from those assumptions and the deviation from that assumption is very catastrophic as matt said uh, it got corroded within weeks so had it been there's a, there's a monitoring and alerting technology, we would have stopped bef uh, the, the, the plant uh, the moment the alert would have come. Now, this is not only from CUI perspective, external, because external is external, it's, it's slow corrosion, but internal corrosion was more severe in this case. So I think internal corrosion monitoring technologies are more applicable. So I would push for the case for automation and monitoring in, this, in such scenarios. So if you were to summarize, what's the role of asset integrity management? And this is a question from someone, you know, what is the, the role of asset integrity management in, in the energy transition? But for what you're saying is, uh, based on lessons learned and what we've, we've seen from the past and, and now, we need to be uh, more automated. We need to be able to have that extra protection in this um, systems of systems approach, because it's a holistic approach to corrosion management. We need to be able to build in monitoring for those exceptional cases. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gorgon project is an example of um, large scale, not only failures on the value engineering decisions point of view, but our corrosion engineers were big let down on that. I mean, they, they have corrosion models based on certain assumptions. Now, if those assumptions like water ingress are violated, they're handicapped. So we need to give all the tools and technologies for them to be, um, uh, to have, to, to, to be more effective and uh, sensors are one of them. And so we talk, and we're talking about water a lot and this, this beautiful thing that we have in the world is actually a problem too. So um, you know, there's a question that's come in about uh, which is the safe water limit uh, in brackets PPM to avoid corrosion in supercritical CO2 streams. 
Matt, I think you're probably best placed to answer that. Yeah, yeah, I could, I could answer that question in terrifying detail. I could do like 45 minutes if required on that question. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it, for, for typically for a CCS project, the PPM is in the, the 50 to 100 PPM range. And it really depends on where you are in the world. If it's a hot part of the world, then maybe it's more like 100 PPM. If it's a cold part of the world, it's more like 50, because obviously you get colder temperatures in the cold parts and warmer temperatures in the warm parts. That gives you a, a free water dew point of about 10 degrees below the minimum operating temperature of the pipeline. And so that way you've always got that 10 degree margin from the minimum temperature where you're going to operate to the point where you start getting free water. Um, now, it's a little bit more complex than that. I told you I can do 45 minutes. I'm just going to throw in one complicating factor. If you've got other polar molecules in your system, like maybe a little bit of TEG carryover uh, or a little bit of methanol or something like that, that can have an impact on the, um, the, the water dew point, but it also impacts the chemistry of any water that um, drops out. So if you add TEG to something, we think about TEG as being something that prevents corrosion. Um, in a CCS system, a small amount of TEG may or may not cause a problem. And that's why you get together with your, um, your friendly thermodynamicists and your corrosion engineers to do that assessment and make sure that you do have a system which is inherently safe under all operating modes. And so, and this is the question that's come in. And so when we talk about pressure and pressure ratings, what, what level of pressure are we talking about here? Um, so CO2 below about sort of 40 bar, it's a gas. Um, under pretty much any normal operating scenario. Um, for most systems, and not all, but most systems, they'll operate, they'll start off operating in a gas phase because our reservoirs that we inject into start off at low pressure. And then as the reservoirs fill up, the pressure of the whole system increases. And then when you get higher than about 40 bar, you'll then transition into liquid CO2. And so CO2 will be fully liquid anywhere above about sort of 60 or 70 bar. So there is mm -hmm. a bit of a gap, but you can get two phases. Um, and then in general, most of the systems that, that we've designed and we've worked on um, have had pipeline design pressures of around about 150 bar. So really benign, quite straightforward, nothing special about them. Corrosion allowances of zero or one millimetres because CO2 is a benign fluid when it's managed properly and you don't get water in the system. Mm. Um, but there certainly are systems that do operate at much higher pressures. Um, I think Northern Lights is a high profile CCS project that operates at significantly higher pressures. Um, so it's not a one size fits all solution. You know, every project's different. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting to say there's not one um, you know, single solution and, and, and nothing's really constant. And, we, you know, I spoke about being in the Middle East and you, know, you hear, you know, you, you're driving along and you listen to the radio and the, the weather report is today, it's hot. It's always hot. <laughs> Five, uh, uh, plus or minus five degrees. So um, it's constant. Yet, yeah, Praffle, you know, we hear a lot about, when, and you mentioned dehydration units a lot today, um, and, um, and they are used in CCS. You know, we, we're having to, from a process point of view, deal with fluctuating temperatures. Um, so it, I presume this is a problem when it comes to water. Um, you might be able to elaborate on this. Yeah, I mean, that's, you're asking a really gas processing question. I think uh, you can process the gas from methane point of view, natural gas, or you can process the gas from carbon dioxide point of view, but invariably it's all similar systems. Dehydration is part of it. Uh, sweetening is part of it in the sense of uh, uh, amine uh, absorbers. Now, invariably there are many kinds of these absorbers, uh, especially when we talk about dehydration, uh, dehydrate, dehydrate, dehydrators can be glycol-based dehydrators, or they can be even molecular sleeve type absorbers, which is used in carbon capture as well. Now, these molecular sleeves operate at intermittent temperatures. You know, they they fluctuate the temperature, there are swings because one is in absorption mode, other is in regeneration mode. So kind of there's a, there's a swing between that. And these fluctuations of temperatures in the CUI range is not a good idea in the sense, you know, they damage the coatings and they, they lead to CUI, they lead to water ingress, condensation, et cetera. So uh, if dehydrators are being used, especially molecular sleeve type, CUI is bound to happen. Uh, there's no foolproof solution have been found so far in the world. You know, there are some coatings which are being proposed, but uh, the industry is wide split. So I think CUI is continuing to happen even in either CCS dehydrators or any other dehydrators. Um, 
and uh, yeah, we we need to be on toes on on that. Yeah. Bring, bring technologies, protection, whatever. So, and you made this point about materials, and uh, and someone, um, one of our um, listeners, have um, just posted a question saying, "Well, we we seem to be pushing materials to their limits, at higher temperatures and pressures," um, as Matt mentioned. So, how can monitoring? You mentioned about monitoring and its place in this this um, holistic approach to corrosion management. How can monitoring techniques help reduce risk when we are talking? fluctuating temperatures and high temperatures? I think there are two angles to this. Um, the first angle is monitoring helps in um, monitor the deviations from the design conditions. So Gorgon project was an example of that, where the design was not to have water ingress, but the deviation that water came in. So monitoring technologies helps in those uh, deviation uh, understanding. Um, and, and the second aspect is about, you know, as Matt mentioned, it's a high pressure system. You know, we have to keep the carbon dioxide liquid. So which means it's 50, 60, even 100 bars or more. Now these are under regulations of pressure systems regulations and they have to be inspected every few years, time bound. In some of the geographies, it's more risk-based, right? So how can monitoring technologies address um, that regulatory regime where, uh, you know, we can justify deferred or long uh, and ex extended inspection intervals rather than premature inspection. So I think monitoring can help the pressure systems, which are from CCS. That's, that's, that's a good point. And uh, thank you, Stuart Bond. Great to hear you and uh, see you, it, your comments um, in front of me. And uh, I won't go through it all. Um, you've um, put your point across very well, but um, Stuart, who works for um, the Association of, um, uh, well, I have to say this correctly, a APIM, Associate for Performance and Materials, um, you know, NACE of old. Um, he talks a lot about needing to raise awareness at the sea level when it comes to um, the issues associated with corrosion um, and, and CO2 systems. So there needs to be some work that goes on um, as far as benchmarking is concerned across asset owners. And so, yeah, I think this is, could be a great topic of discussion going into 2022. Um, someone mentioned, uh, Matt, you, you, you mentioned most CCS want to work with the CO2 as a liquid. Why not keep the CO2 as a gas to avoid corrosion issues? That's a good point. Um, yeah, it, it is a good point. Um, I guess from a corrosion point of view, um, the gas is, is sometimes the worst case because the water is less soluble. So it's more likely to drop out. But it does mean that other potential sort of corrosion and environmental cracking issues are less severe. Um, but it really comes down to the operability of your system. If you've got a reservoir um, which is operating at 100 bar, then you've got very little choice but to make sure that it's arriving at the top of the well in the liquid phase, otherwise it won't get down um, into the reservoir itself. Um, it also helps that when you're transporting um, CO2, if you transport it as a liquid, it's a lot more dense, and that means that the pipelines are smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be a significant cost saving. So there, there are balances, um, and that decision about what phase your CO2 is going to be transported in um, and what your um, phase you're operating in. Um, there is a cost and risk perspective to that, but then there's also just the, the, the sort of physical limitations of where your CO2 is coming from and where is it going? You know, is it coming from a people importing it by ship? Uh, is it coming from local industry? Is it coming from a hydrogen plant? Is it coming from a hydrocarbon stream? And then where is it going? Are you exporting it by ship? Is it going into a reservoir? And what's the pressure of that reservoir, not just on day one, but on day 1,000 and day 10,000? So there are a lot of considerations there. Um, it's a difficult thing to balance. And many projects um, operate part of their life in gas mode and part of their life in liquid mode as a way to manage that. It, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, and it's just a question of finding the right solution for each particular project. And um, touching on the Gorgon project, um, Someone mentioned uh, George uh, Trujillo, which hopefully I've uh, pronounced the name correctly. It seems like there's still a long way to go um, in terms of applying best practices and design standards. Um, he mentioned DMV recently released a RP on design and ops for CO2 pipelines. Do you think the current understanding of the challenges requires additional efforts to acquire and spread knowledge and best practices when it comes to CO2? CCS and, uh, and corrosion management. 
Yeah, look, absolutely. So I'm on the ISO committee, which is responsible for technical reports and standards related to CO2. And I can tell you, like that DNV standard, there's, there's more coming. We've learned an awful lot since Gorgon started up. It was only a few years ago, but this industry is growing. Um, and as an industry, the only way we can succeed is by sharing information um, and, and having the, the DNV standard and, you know, sort of the other documentation and reports which are starting to, to turn up to support engineers doing design um, can only help. Uh, I'd like to think that the days of the sort of catastrophic and sort of slightly uh, elementary error that was made on Gorgon are over. Um, that's probably me being a little over optimistic, um, but hopefully that, that message will, will spread. And I mean, as engineers, as we know, we can never do things perfectly, but we can learn and we can continue to do things better and we can minimize risk, but we can never make it go away. Mm, absolutely. And uh, we, we, we're talking a lot about um, having a robust solution moving forwards, um, extend the life of assets or when it comes to new assets um, coming into production, you know, we, we are talking beyond 2050. Yep. So this, we need to really consider the, the life um, time of these solutions and, and how robust they are. So. Uh, Prafor, you you talked, you mentioned about monitoring and sensors and their place as part of this this systems to systems approach to corrosion management. I mean, how robust are these sensors? How long can you see these sensors lasting in the field? Well, I mean, um, I think there's a good level of development happened because corrosion is an old issue and um, it's not a new issue. So, so technologies have been developed and proven. I mean, some are more advanced than the others. For example. We're talking about CUI, uh, corrosion data provides that sensors, and uh, there are many others which are internal corrosion. There, uh, there are some de under development systems which are uh, new, uh, not proven yet, but for say, uh, stress corrosion cracking or hydrogen uh, ingress. So I think, uh, you know, technology continues to be evolved, but some are more mature, um, internal and external. And of course, cathodic protection remains the main pro pro uh, protection method, but now even monitoring of cathodic protection is being mature. Uh, um, James, I would like to mention, uh, in addition to monitoring, it's not only about hardware, but also predictive analytics. Say, what can we infer from, um, from the sensors? Say, in, in the case of, say, Matt mentioned about water ingress in the Gorgon project. So I would, I would imagine if the water was being monitored and the amount of PPM levels in the carbon dioxide stream, then, the prediction of corrosion rates could have been done rather than directly corrosion sensors. So corrosion sensors are more of reactive method or you know, they, they monitor once the degradation has happened, but sometimes the degradation can be so fast that you don't have time to react. So for those systems, you need prediction methodologies, which means we have to measure parameters which are other parameters rather than corrosion itself. So water is an example of that. So I would say, James, it's, uh, you know, quite reasonably matured, all these uh, monitoring technologies. Many other applications are under development, but uh, I think it's high time we adopt them for new infrastructure. Okay, well, um, thank you, Prafal. That's, um, that's a good answer to that question. And uh, I think we um, have exhausted some of the questions that have come in. Uh, there's lots of good comments that have come in too, which we'll take on board. Um, so, in order to wrap up the session, um, unless anyone wants to um, come in as a live uh, attendee um, with, uh, with any questions, then maybe we look to, to, to wrap this one up. And uh, I always like to end these sessions by you know, asking the, the panelists, you know, if there's one thing that you want people to uh, remember from, from this session and, and go away and think about and think about how they can contribute towards this topic, now, what would it be? Uh, so I'll start with you, Matt. You know, what is that, 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 that kind of thing that you think we all need to take away with us? Yeah, um, th those of us who, who work in the oil and gas industry are inevitably going to be people who are working in, the, in CCS. <clears throat> um, and I just, the, the one thing is that I'd like to say is that CO2 is a very different fluid from that of hydrocarbons. Um, and it means that when we're doing engineering, um, particularly with corrosion, but it applies across the board. Um, it is a different fluid. It does do things that are a little bit unintuitive to those of us that are used to working in hydrocarbons. And so it does require curious engineering. And if you're working with CO2, 
I'd really encourage you to ask questions, share knowledge, because we are learning as we're going and it requires creative and curious engineers to solve these sorts of problems. So be curious then, is that what you say, Matt? That's the one thing. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 then talk about curiosity. Someone mentioned um, just just now about you know, is, is there any published data um, that can be shared on the maintenance costs in OPEX of CCS? Uh, it's a good question. Um, there's, there's not much. The problem is, is that there's not that much operating experience, um, and and those projects that have been operating. They've sort of operated within the ecosystem of a single energy company. So, for example, Chevron with Gorgon or uh, Equinor with um, Snowvit um, or, or Shell with Quest up in Canada. Um, so there's not a huge amount of information on costs. But uh, one of the things that Praffel has, has referred to more than once is that it's very analogous to um, gas treatment and gas transmission. And I think that, yeah, from a, a OPEX perspective, that is a very, very strong starting point in terms of what is required um, fundamentally uh, in terms of management of, of assets from an external point of view the problems are all the same you know we've got different temperatures and then those sorts of temperature swings are important to keep in mind um, and then from an internal point of view co2 is pretty straightforward there's no great need for chemicals outside of the capture processes um, there's not a huge amount of need for you know, anything, you know, it's, it's all the usual sort of stuff, you know, compressors and pumps and all these bits of equipment that we're used to dealing with in the gas world. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a, a good reference. Uh, I think that's because the information doesn't exist. Okay. But I can say that you can get good OPEX estimates by following normal gas transmission um, procedures and go-bys. Well, uh, thank you, Ali Akbar, for that question. And, um, and thank you for being curious, because I think that's what Matt is saying. <laughs> us in the uh, in the corrosion management world need to be more curious about how we can help and, and contribute um and uh talk about being curious uh, Stuart Bond you you're a very curious man and uh you you've um got a question for Matt um before we go into platform what what he would like to end with um so so Matt considering end of life for CCS well what confidence do we have on the plug and abandonment steps to ensure no leakage and that the downhole tubing and equipment will remain fit for purpose? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, the, the life of a, of a CO2 disposal reservoir in the projects that I've worked on has either been 10,000 years or 50,000 years. And these are different timeframes from what we're used to dealing with. You know, like we sort of think about something that's 25 years. Oh, that's quite a lot. Um, so the, the plugging and abandonment, it's pretty old school. Uh, it's concrete is essentially the answer. It is not um, let's plug and abandon and put the well in a position where it can be reused. Um, when a reservoir reaches its ultimate pressure um, and the wells are being abandoned, um, the general plan is to literally fill them and make sure that their integrity is stronger than the integrity of the reservoir itself. Um, our understanding of the reservoirs uh, is very good. Um, there are people out there, I'm not one of them, but good. Um, subsurface engineers who can assure that the integrity of these reservoirs is over the long term is very high. Obviously, we're talking about geological timescales. And so when it comes to plugging and abandonment, the goal is to make sure that the, it's not the weakest point in the system, that it's always stronger than that of the reservoir itself. Um, but that does lead us towards slightly more um, robust solutions than, you know, double block and bleed. Very good. And uh, I think Stuart's grateful for that great answer. So thank you. Thanks, uh, and let's and let's wrap up Praffle in terms of the one thing that you would like people to go away with. And let me guess it's been proactive with monitoring and, and prediction, but I'll let you uh, decide. Well, well that, 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 that is part of it. But uh, for me, it's really, you know, I have a few decades of uh, my working life left. And I would like <laughs> I would like to see things being done differently. The, the, the opportunities are there. The key word is there are a lot of greenfield projects are coming and they are for the good. They are for green, they are for uh, energy transition uh, in the form of CCS, in the form of LNG, in the form of decarbonized fuels, hydro, hydrogen. From corrosion management point of view, um, what can we do different? Obviously we can do a lot of things different, but the oil and gas industry in the past have been very conservative, but this is an opportunity to bring new practices and new technologies into the mix 
when when the designers the front end engineering designers and the material selection uh, automation companies are building those uh, assets the the corrosion engineers needs to be on the table and uh, uh, that was missing in the past, you know, because, you know, asset integrity is an afterthought. But now is an opportunity where the new assets are being built. Asset integrity should be part of the process right from the beginning, right at the design stage. And hence, the new technologies, predictive models, automation, sensors should be part of that. So that's my takeaway. It's interesting you say that because um, you know, a lot of work in the Middle East with some of those big operators as part of their corrosion management programs. They say they're very clear and saying the biggest impact in corrosion management is at the design phase. If you build that robust system um, and include proactive uh, monitoring and predictive technologies, that will that will help um, companies moving forward and operators moving forward. So thank you for that, Preffel. Um, so um, again, what is that one thing? What is that one word? Can you come up Think with different. one word? Be different. Think different. That's, that's two words. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, excellent. Well, um, it's been a great session. Really enjoyed this session. Um, it's great to talk about a new exciting um, topic. Um, thank you, William, for saying it's been a brilliant webinar. I really have enjoyed it. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to close off 2021. Wow, what a year. Um, and who knows what next year is going to be. But what we do know is that CCS um, is, is something which is becoming a big um, area for um, for governments to um, to deal with and um, and thank you Matt for companies like you uh, who you work for to to really help us understand this better and Praffle for continue to try and contribute where you can so um, it's been a great year from a point of view of um, innovation and um, I like to say you know, have a great end to the year um, and any festive holidays um, um, which are religious holidays that you're uh, having um have a great one stay safe and, and well and look forward to having some more cy over coffee sessions in the new year so thank you all take care bye-bye thanks james thanks Breffel. thanks everyone thank you